All right, now that I have your attention, thank you so much for joining us today again um, to the data science seminar from the University of Washington. Um, we have with us today, Dr. Uh, Kiran Vardy, who is a postdoctoral scholar at the Department of Civil and uh, Chemical Engineering at the University of Washington, and also a postdoctoral fellow at the eScience Institute. He obtained his bachelor's and master's degrees in mechanical engineering from the Indian Institute of Technology in Madras. His current research um, interests are accelerated material design and discovery with emphasis on topological and geometrical representations of data. At UDAP, he focuses on building computational tools to automate the design of high throughput experiments using techniques such as reinforcement learning and active learning. Um, I'm happy to host Kieran today, and I'm looking forward to hearing um, his talk and listening about um, functional data analysis tools for autonomous experimentation. Uh, please welcome Kieran. Thanks for the kind introduction, Nicoletta, and thank you all for joining. Um, I'm really excited to be here today and talk to you all about uh, a part of research that, I, uh, that I'm doing very next to this place in Benson Hall using uh, a technique called functional data analysis tools. And the goal is to accelerate the design and discovery of materials that enable our uh, future uh, using uh, autonomous experimentations. So I wanted to start off by saying that materials uh, new or old uh, enable the different technologies that we now interact. And they also have the potential to fundamentally change our future. Be it be, uh, whether it can be uh, coming up with better materials to make flexible electronics, or improve the current state of the art battery materials, or even improve transportation. For example, if you could come up with a material that is much lighter weight than what we use, even if uh, aero, aerodynamic efficiency of 0.1 points can be massive in terms of how much you can travel using the same amount of fuel. So there are a lot of advantages of coming up with new materials. Uh, but however, there is one challenge that restricts uh, mater uh, new materials coming up at the same pace as, for example, a new software. The reason for this is uh, designing or developing a material would involve timelines on the scale of 20 years or 30 years just for discovering them. And if you are thinking about implementing them into industrial industry scale production or even using uh, in your daily life, it's going to be on the orders of 50 years, for example. So one of the research that, uh, that I am really interested in, uh, along with a few others uh, across the US and elsewhere, is to accelerate this discovery pipeline from decades to a few years. And the, and the approach that we are taking um, uh, in the POSO group in Benson Hall in chemical engineering is to use a bunch of robots and a very robust set of data management analysis pipelines to teach robots to do scientific experiments so that they can run 24 by 7 and then make very intelligent decisions about where to sample next, which material to synthesize, and measure them and quantify its, uh, its performance in, it, in, it, in its final form. And there have been a lot of interest both from universities, industry, and several federal agencies as well in, in this kind of research. Uh, today's talk, I'm going to focus on a very particular class of materials that we are interested in called nanomaterials. You could think of nanomaterials as these tiny, tiny particles, but they have really, really important applications when it comes to next generation of technology, whether it be improving the efficiency of solar cells or coming up with better catalytic materials or improving the performance of batteries using a, uh, using a class of ma materials called nanowires. So we are primarily an, an experimental group. So we like to think we make these nanopart nanoscale particles by using a method called solution-based uh, synthesis, wherein in a very simple terms, what we are essentially doing is to take different chemical components and mix them in a very specific order and concentration or volume fraction and that gives us to uh, uh, that gives us a way to direct the rea chemical reaction in a certain manner, so that we end up making uh, particles that that have nanoscale features. Uh, and we also need to have some control over um, 
the reaction conditions such as temperature, the time of the reaction, and the pH at which uh, these are occurring. As you can see, this is already a very, very large dimensional space. For example, we have control variables that are of the order of 20 or 30 that we have to either manually or use robots to control. So because we are making nanoscale particles, we can't look them through the naked eye and then realize, okay, we, I, made, I made a nanoparticle that looks like a sphere versus a cylinder, but we have to use a very complicated technique such as microscopy. But the d downside to using microscopy is, although it's very accurate, it takes a lot of time to even process a single sample. So even to get a single data point, it could take as much as a day. And if you, if you include the time to prepare the sample to take the microscopic image. However, we can make use of some of the features of this nanoscale, nanoscale particles to obtain uh, some signals that have strong correlations to the structures. For example, the nanoscale particles that we make, we make in our lab have strong correlations in terms of how they interact with light. If we shine a light on them of a particular wavelength, they come up with some uh, features in terms of uh, absorbing, a, absorbing a light or scattering the light. And then if we use a detector to uh, measure how much it absorbed or scattered, you can then uh, try to figure out or map out uh, what is the structure to a particular uh, signal that you have. So in order to obtain that, what we do is to we shine a light of a particular uh, wavelength in a particular range and then obtain how much of the light has been absorbed uh, uh, before it reached the detector by the sample. So you could think of this data that we have uh, as a function uh, where on the y-axis I have the uh, absorption. As technically, it's called an extension, but that doesn't really matter for this talk. And on the x-axis, I have my uh, wavelength that I'm varying, uh, uh, varying of the light that I'm shining on the sample. So from a pure data point of view, if you want to think about it, we have several design variables. These can include chemical identities or the concentrations or the amount of uh, solution that you added to make the final product. We have a structure in that you can represent in Y, but all we can get as a data point to characterize the structure is Y hat, which is the function that we just described with the Y axis and an X axis uh, uh, representing the wavelength and Y axis representing the extinction or absorption. So by doing uh, by thinking about experiment this way, what we can do is to digitize uh, our experimental synthesis pipeline and now start to think about doing some sort of an optimization task wherein uh, we, if I specify a particular target uh, uh, as, my, uh, as my target material, for example, in this case, uh, let's say I specify the target to be nanoscale uh, materials that look like a cylinder. And I can use some computer simulations to figure out what the exact spectrum should look like and then feed it back to my experimental pipeline to see if it can make, the, make a particle that has the same uh, spectral signature. So I, what uh, the pipeline for optimization would look as follows. We have a bunch of design variables that we can vary. We can use robots and uh, very sophisticated uh, measurement techniques to uh, auto auto automatically collect the data in the spectral form. And then we, we can compare the spectra that we obtained from the experiments with the one that we simulated and try to see if, if, they, if both of them matched. So, however, in order to be able to do that, we, we, need a, we need to address two problems. The first one being, how are you going to measure uh, the blue curve versus the red curve on here? So because these two are functions, how, how are you going to mm, come up with a score or loss function that is going to describe whether you are reaching closer to the target or further away from it. And the second one is we need to do what is what we call black box optimization. The reason being, because we are interacting with an experiment, I don't have a closed form solution that I can run a gradient descent through, but I can always ask for, for some samples, meaning if I, if I want to make a particular sample that has these, re these rea reaction conditions, I can always run an experiment and get the data but I don't know the exact nature of how the experiment got to this particular function that I, that I was able to measure, right? That's why we need a back box optimization and also need a way to compare the spectral data. So first, uh, I'm gonna first describe the way to compare the spectral data and then we are gonna move to, uh, move to looking at a solution that we can do black box optimization so that we can finish up this pipeline to accelerate, uh, accelerate, uh, 
making the making materials in an accelerated fashion using optimization technique. So for a moment, let's forget that we are working with functional data sets, but instead consider the functions that we obtain as an n-dimensional vector. This is possible because on a computer you would have certain discrete samples of your function, and then you could consider them to be an n-dimensional vector and then define a distance using things such as Euclidean distance. Uh, to illustrate how an Euclidean distance works on functions and to potentially uh, identify any pitfalls that might there be, uh, I, I have a simple example that, uh, that I'll use it as a case study to explain how, how the distances work in function spaces. So let's start with the black code that we have, that I have on the slide as a reference and make a copy of it and then shift it to, towards a different peak position, right? Because we made this change, we expect the, these two curves to have some distance if you measure the similarity. And if we use Euclidean distance, that turns out to be some random 3.34 units. That exact units or the exact quantity of this measurement doesn't really matter much. But let's do one more step and make a copy of the blue curve and then shift it further forward. Now, we would ideally expect the distance to increase, but if you use the Euclidean distance as defined here, it would not. So what would you end up having is that even though if you made a progress in terms of making the particles that you want, you are not really seeing that improvement in your loss function, so you do, you're not, your model is not gonna train itself to that, see that this is an improvement, let's say. Uh, let's also try to make one more change wherein we, I take the blue curve, keep the peak position the same, but slightly broaden it. So what I essentially did is to change the shape of the function by itself, and, and, and in doing so, I should have uh, some similarity mismatch, and if I use the Euclidean distance to measure it, it says three units, which if you look uh, at the three values that we have on the slide, is lesser than the, both the red and blue curve, although the green curve has the least uh, similarity in terms of shape to our reference black curve. So we do have a problem here, and that problem is uh, essentially related to the data representation choice that we made. Because Euclidean distance only measures only cares about what's, uh, what's happening on the y-axis, but all the changes that we made are on the x-axis or to the shape of the function, it's not capturing any of that information. And if you, uh, to analyze the uh, spectra that we obtained from nanoscale materials, analyzing the shape and the changes on x-axis is very important. So that's why we have, uh, we decided to use this technique called functional data analysis purely because the data that we obtain is of, is of the function form. So in functional data analysis, we could measure a shape mismatch between any two different functions by first decoupling the information on the x-axis and the y-axis separately, and then coming, coming up with models that, uh, that can capture the distance on the x-axis and y-axis. And one such way of doing it is to first measure what is called an amplitude distance, wherein we take all the curves that we want to analyze our computer distance from, and then peak align them such that the primary peak of all the points aligns with the reference one. For example, in here, the dotted, uh, dotted black curve has its peak aligned to all the three different gray curves that I am trying to compute a distance, and now you could compute a distance that comp simply measures the distance on the amplitude, uh, amplitude which is the y-axis. And similarly, I can also define what is called a phase distance, wherein all the variation is only on the x-axis. So now we, we have somehow taken care of the amplitude part in the amplitude distance, and whatever is left, we are trying to measure it on the x-axis. So let's see a way of uh, uh, measuring the amplitude distance. What, what are the closed form solutions? Once again, because we are interested in quantifying the shape, what we can do is to take the derivative of the function so that if I have a sharper peak or a broader peak, I have this information already encoded in the derivative, and if I try to compute a distance, that should capture the shape information related to it, right? And because we are working with functions, uh, the way to compute the distances uh, on functions is to use a function norm, which is very, which is the equivalent of Euclidean norm, uh, but it involves integrals because you are dealing with functions. And one advantage of using this is that even if you have two functions that have different sampling points on the x-axis, you would still be able to very accurately compute this integral and your distance would still make sense. So that's amplitude distance, but we also have another component in phase distance. Uh, 
arguably this is the interesting part of functional data analysis where we try to slowly move into a different part of mathematical uh, technique called differential geometry. But I think it's best explained using an example rather than de de delving very deep into the intric intricate mathematical details of it. So what I have on this slide is a single peak curve. And for illustration purposes, I have uh, highlighted six different points on this curve. Now, let's uh, think of a way of uh, making a transformation to this curve so that we get a different shape that has same intensity, same y values, but has a different shape. And one way to do that is to simply swap around these positions randomly. And then, uh, yes, you, you do get a uh, curve that looks slightly different, but it has the same y ranges as before. So we have the amplitude part taken care of. Now we could use uh, this transformation that we made to compute the phase distance. To do that, I'm going to track uh, the point, six points on the first curve and the second curve on a two-dimensional axis, and then going to track all the changes that I made. What I did here is that since on the second curve, the second, uh, sorry, second point and the third point uh, are swapped around between the first two curves, I have a cross mark. And similarly, since the fifth point on both the curves is the same because it hasn't undergone any swapping, it's, uh, it's marked at five, five coordinate. And because this is for, I, I'm showcasing for six points, if I have multiple set of points, maybe 100 or 200, I would get a very smooth uh, looking curve. Uh, that um, digitally represents the transformation that I just verbally uh, described to you. Now just let's also think about a way of not making any changes, and that would be uh, that the transformation would be represented in this 2D axis on the x equal to y line because you are assigning everything to the same thing, no changes at all. So now if you think about it, we can use this information uh, on that we plotted on the 2D axis to define a phase distance because the identity transformation that makes no change is on the x equal to y axis and all the changes that you made are around it. So you, essentially your phase distance should capture the area between these two curves. Uh, so we could do a little bit better than that by defining, uh, by adding few constraints to what kind of transformation we are after. First we would need a identity transform that makes no changes to the reference curve. We already have that. Second, we need a way of uh, continuously going from, uh, going from the single peak one to the double peak one and going backwards so that we can make the transformations from both forward and backward. It turns out if you have these three properties satisfied by a transformation, it is called a mathematical structure called group. And the inter interesting part of this is that now you could use techniques borrowed from differential geometry to define a distance to even do statistics as we will see later on the, in the talk, depending on the, depending on the time. Uh, so now I'm gonna take a small detour into the uh, land of differential geometry to tell you very hopefully intuitively how to uh, compute this uh, phase distance. Uh, but first, we need to add one constraint to the set of transformations that, uh, that, that I'm looking for. Because we need this transformation to be inver have an inverse, we need to, uh, in order to compute this uh, efficiently using optimization technique, we need to pin down the uh, boundaries to the same value. So, so if we allow the boundaries to change, then the optimization never converges. So, what we are doing is we are essentially taking all the transformation that we are after, but then constraining it to constraining them to a small set. So anytime you do this in a geometry space, what happens is you come up with this uh, interesting structures. One such example is if you restrict all the points in a 2D plane to be at a particular distance from a center, you get this structure called circle. So I'm sure most of you are aware. And if you do the same thing in a 3D, you get a structure called sphere. So if you show these kind of plots to a differential geometry person, they will call them as this quote unquote structure called manifolds because on manifolds you could define not just the geometry, you could also define a way of closed formally compute distances and also perform statistics uh, uh, although the spaces are slightly curved. So it turns out the restriction that we put uh, at the top of the slide would result in such structure to the transformation that, that we are after in particular, it's also a sphere, but it's in a very higher dimension. So it, think of them as, uh, as these points in a very high dimensional space, n or 100 or 200, but you still have a spherical structure. So 
uh, the way to visualize this is that you have now to compute phase distance, we need to measure a distance between um, between the identity and the transformation that you made. So uh, because you are, you you are restricted to the spherical uh, manifold, you can only move along the surface. So this is equivalent to if you want to compute distance between two cities on Earth, you can't draw a tunnel through the Earth and then say that's the distance. That would be the blue line uh, that you have here. That that's not allowed. You could only compute the distance along this uh, dotted black curve that you have here. And and people have figured out a way of computing this distance in higher dimensions, so we could use that as a, as a measure for our phase distance. So with that, we have a clear definition of what amplitude phase distance means, which, and let's see if it can actually solve the issues that we identified before. before. So what I have here is the same set of curves that we have shown earlier, but the distances are now computed using amplitude phase. We could see that based on the distances, blue curve is the closest, followed by the green one, and then followed by the red one. This is partly or to a large extent answers all the, uh, all the issues that we had with uh, being able to measure shape uh, when we compute uh, function distances. Uh, that answers this first one of the problems that I had with uh, building an optimization workflow. Now let's switch back to uh, solving the problem of uh, black box optimization. Uh, so to solve black box optimization, we borrow a technique from machine learning called Bayesian optimization, which is a technique to do global optimization when you have only sample access to your function that you're trying to optimize. So in this case, my samples would be my different concentrations or chemical identities of the materials that I'm working with. To illustrate how Bayesian optimization would work in the experimental setting that I have, I have I'm gonna use a two-dimensional space to visually show how it would look like. So let's say I start with four samples in my design space, and then I run the experiment, synthesize my samples and measure them, and then obtain uh, my, uh, my UVV spectra, that the, those are of the function form. And then now I can compute a distance with respect to a target using amplitude phase distance or Euclidean distance. That, that should give me uh, a two-dimensional two function with some values uh, filled out because that's where we sample. And the second component of Bayesian optimization is that we need a surrogate model and a probabilistic surrogate model that can predict both the mean value and also uncertainty about the prediction that the surrogate model is making. And to do that, we need to put some priors on the functions that we are modeling. And for us, a Gaussian prior, which simply says that all the functions that we are after is, uh, are very smooth. Uh, especially if you know a uh, value of the function that I have at any given location, the values around the, up to a certain correlation length will be very similar to the value that we have. This, this is a valid approximation for, um, for our systems because materials th that we work with often tend to have very smoothly varying properties. So this is not a big, um, big hit in terms of having a very strong prior. So, the advantage of using a sub, uh, probabilistic surrogate in Bayesian optimization is that we can come up with some form of a feedback loop wherein we can make use of the uncertainty that we have on our model prediction to, uh, to guide our uh, next set of experiments to sample where our uncertainty is very high or where the model is not able to predict with a higher accuracy. So we wanted to take the Bayesian optimization approach combining with uh, our ability to compute distances uh, on, a, on a real experimental system. So uh, I, on this project, I worked with graduate student Kwat, who uh, managed to uh, come up with a very uh, efficient way of uh, automating synthesis of nanoparticles and also measure them, so that all we needed was to have a very uh, robust uh, Bayesian optimization uh, workflow that we can combine in a closed loop to run this experiment autonomously to make a target the, that we're after. So in this, uh, in this case study, we had eight design variables, all are different, uh, different chemical components that we needed to mix with of a particular concentration. So we don't know what's the concentration that would make a structure such as the one that plotted here, for, which is a nano cylinder of a particular size and length, but we can compute what its UVV spectrum would look like uh, on, a, on a computer. So this would be our target, and we are using uh, our automated equipment and the workflow that we just mentioned to uh, obtain that. So 
to illustrate how this um, optimization would look like, I'm gonna switch back to using Euclidean distance so that you would much appreciate the why you need a functional data analysis component to it. So for, it, for Bayesian optimization to start, we'll start with a small uh, random sample from our design space. Because I am working with the eight dimensional design space, I can't plot them in a 2D to show you where, uh, what the exact design space locations are. All I'm what I'm trying to do is to plot all the curves that I'm collecting at any given iteration, and then fall, and then run a certain number of iteration to see if I am getting closer to, closer to my target. It turns out even after six iterations and over 200 to 300 samples, we hardly made anything that looks closer to our target. So this is a very big waste of resources. So we wanted to switch back to using amplitude distance and we see that even by iteration one and two, we already started to make some samples that look like our target. And by iteration six, everything that we are making look like our targets. This is, I don't know if you folks appreciate it, but if you ask me or what to do this optimization, we would have taken one week to give you one sample. But our robots, when, when using Bayesian automation, can, run, can give us hundreds of samples in two days. That's like a massive acceleration when, uh, when, when you think of the scales of a graduate student or postdoc working in the lab. So with this success, uh, we wanted to see if we, we can use functional data analysis for a few other problems that we have. Since this talk is also focused on functional data analysis, I'm gonna try to show you a few data analysis components that may be of interest to some of you. Uh, nothing better, the, so the easiest way to start explaining analysis in functional data is to compare them to different vector space um, analysis. So I'm sure many of you would be aware of what a PCA is. It's a method to reduce dimensions, to do lower dimensional projections. But the way I like to think about this is that we are taking, we are after a projection that tries to minimize the variance, uh, uh, minimize the variance across its coordinate axis. But uh, the mo PCA model is centered around the mean value, so you need a way to compute mean. On vector space, it, it, we have a closed form solution of how to compute a mean. But on functional data, because the data has a geometry to it. We can't use the closed form solution. We have to run an optim we have to run an optimization wherein we are after a function that has the least distance to all the points, which is very similar to how a geometric description of how uh, how we ended up with the closed form of mean value. But that's just to say that it is doable because we have a, a definition for for the distance. And the second step in PCA is to compute uh, minimal covariance projection and maximal diagonal variance. And the way to do that is to compute the variance of your data and then take singular value decomposition, for example. So the key thing to note here is that we need a way to compute variance. But in functional data, we just saw that we have two different kind of variance that are possible. One that is happening on the y-axis, one that is happening on the x-axis. So we need a way to measure two different uh, variances. So if you think geometrically, in PCA what we are doing is we are transforming and rotating your axis such that they align very well with your variance. But we can't really do that on function spaces again because they have a job curve geometry. But the, the, uh, the advantage of using a differential geometry notion to function spaces is that since we have a spherical geometry to our, uh, uh, to our functional data, we can again borrow a technique called tangent space uh, of a manifold and define uh, if a a Euclidean version or a flat space, a flat approximation of your curved manifold centered around the mean because we are, uh, we are uh, once again fitting a PCA model and then project all the points from your manifold onto this tangent space where you can now run the exact same PCA that you would do on a vector space and then project them back to your manifold to obtain the, obtain the vari variations on this geometry. This is again an approximation but it's one way of doing PCA on functional data. Uh, I wanted to quickly give you some overview, one way overview of one of the examples in our, from our lab. I won't have much time to uh, dwell into the exact details of the material system, but uh, in a nutshell, what we have is uh, we have um, we have managed to run a lot of high throughput experiments and obtain data of the orders of 500 to 1,000 uh, spectra. And but we wanted to summarize uh, what are the changes that we observe by doing this high throughput experiment. Uh, when we ran uh, functional PCA on it, and then uh, 
imposed a Gaussian uh, probabilistic model on the coefficient, we were able to capture some information about the different, what does different components mean. For example, on PC1, which captures the at most 50% of the variance, we see that as we increase the coefficients, we are seeing an emergence of a peak. And this directly correlates with the fact that we either have made, managed to make a nanoparticle uh, or not managed to make a nanoparticle. If you have a nanoparticle in your solution, you will see a peak. If you don't, you don't see a peak. So that, that is being captured by this PC1 component. Similarly, on PC2, it is telling us uh, some information about whether we are making large nanoscale particles or very tiny nanoscale particles. So the size of the particles is directly correlated with the uh, intensity that you have at the higher wavelengths of this function. Similarly, PC3 and PC4 also have some meanings, but uh, that's, for a, uh, that's for another day. Uh, if you're interested, I would I encourage you to check out this paper by Casper, who used uh, functional PCA among many other techniques to, um, to analyze and deduce some design rules of uh, making gold nanoparticles by using, uh, by using, by making certain uh, changes to a sequence defined molecule called peptide. Uh, so uh, the, if, if you have any questions or if you're interested in the work, please uh, talk to me after, uh, after the talk and I'm happy to discuss. I, I also wanted to give, quickly give a shower, uh, quickly introduce you to another model that you could run on functional data, which is of interest to some of the work that I am currently doing, uh, is, which is called functional k-means clustering. If you're familiar with k-means clustering, all you are trying to do is to take the distance component wherever in your k-means clustering algorithm and replace it with the functional distance when you're working with functions. So to illustrate the advantage here again, I have a very clumsy looking functional data uh, up here and I am running this through a simple Euclidean distance, once again relaxing the functional data constraint, but I still don't see my clusters uh, making any sense. They still look as clumsy as the one that I started with. But if I, I, I do know that there is some structure in it because I encoded it in a slightly complex manner. So if I swap the Euclidean distance with the uh, function space distance, I now recover the structure that, that's in that, that was in the initial clumsy looking data set. Namely, we have a single peak, double peak, triple peak, and there is some amplitude variance uh, on top of it. As a material scientist, why I'm excited about this is this sort of s sorting the data has very close relation to one of the techniques to measure crystal crystallographic order in materials in meso scale or, na, or at atomic scale, using techniques such as X-ray diffraction or small angle scattering, both of which result in functional form. We have similar uh, aspects of shifting the peaks or the observing the variance uh, in terms of the samples that are not characteristic of the structure, which defines the property, but are just a characteristic of the measurement and some uh, parameters that we don't really care about. So um, once again, I wanted to give a quick shout out to this paper that we recently put out, uh, wherein Karen and I were working with a class of material called block copolymers, which have the tendency to make the very um, very ordered structures that have uh, potentially can be used in flexible electronics, for example. But uh, what we did was to, we took a lot of data from, from the large design space and try to come up with the phase mapping uh, problem wherein uh, we segregate functions that look similar into a single region. And we were able to use the, that model to come up with better design rules for the next set of experiments that we can run or even understand how uh, the design rules for making one order structures versus another. So if you're interested, uh, I'd encourage you to check out this paper. And with that, I'd like to conclude uh, with the following thoughts. I hope I, uh, I pique some interest in high throughput experimentation, but uh, really the point of this talk was to tell you that we do need new computational techniques. And if we do manage to integrate some sort of autonomous decision making based on the data that we work with, we can gain massive advantage in terms of synthesizing or discovering new material. Uh, but we do have a lot of challenges in terms of defining surrogate models that make sense physically and also data representation that makes uh, sense physically. And, and I showed one example of the, us dealing with functions data and the way we managed to come up with a representation that was useful in not just in terms of computing a loss function, but also in terms of running statistical analysis. Uh, 
with that, I would like to thank uh, my group, of course, my emerging mentor, Professor Lilo Pozo in the Dep Department of Chemical Engineering, eScience for the Data Science Fellowship, and also other funding agencies for supporting this work. Uh, if I did manage to pique anybody's interest in any of the functional data analysis or geometric data analysis in general, here are a bunch of resources that helped me uh, understand this concept in the past three years and few papers that we uh, put out using these techniques. I'd be happy to talk to you all about uh, how to go about uh, delving deep into these methods, uh, but I'm happy to take any questions at this point. Thank you. Thank you very much, Kiran. Um, please ask any questions you may have. Yeah, um, so the question, uh, I'm just, I, I was asked to repeat the question because of the rec recording, sir. So the question is about, uh, we used a technique called Bayesian optimization for running autonomous experimentation, why not use reinforcement learning? I think uh, fundamentally, um, the goal in re reinforcement learning is slightly different to Bayesian optimization. In Bayesian optimization, we are trying to optimize a technique. In reinforcement learning, we are trying to learn a policy to, to make better decisions. We, in this case, we don't have to make better decisions. We know what decisions to make. We know what materials to mix. We just don't know at what concentrations or what reaction conditions. So we just need to find out those reaction conditions to make this target. So that's the, that's the deliberation that we had. Yeah, good question. Thank you. Are you talking about oh. this one? Um, and the, um, so everything that I presented, oh, okay, again, I, I'm going to repeat the question um, that the way I define the phase distance here is for one dimensional functions. What would it have if it if your functions were of three dimension uh, of some sort? Or even two, yeah. Uh, I think um, the general framework of using geometry stays the same, but I think the computing these uh, transformations which are called warping functions is going to be a completely different ball game. Uh, yeah, uh, I, I can, I can tell you that even computing a one warping function for this is a very compute intensive task. We have to actually use Hayek to compute one single uh, alignment. So it's a, it's not a, it's not a fun optimization. So I think to answer in one sentence, it is possible that you could use same kind of geometric techniques, but optimizing on a computer would be a challenging one. Yes, so um, to repeat the question, so I showed most of the examples on UVV spectra, but I'm also interested, and in our lab, we primarily collect a lot of SACS data. How would this change, how would this analysis change to any of the SACS data that we have? So we did manage to do it for one class of SACS curve, and I agree with you that SACS is much, much more complicated. But for this particular system, the SACS curves are very smooth, and we could actually get uh, the same, uh, this, uh, at the end of the day, Sachs curve is also a function, right? We start with the two-dimensional function, but you could reduce it to a 
reduce it to a function that we can plot on a two dimensions with a Q value on X axis and an IQ value on the Y axis. As long as the functions are smooth, uh, our technique is able to do that. But we needed to do some kind of a smoothing before we could actually very repeat, uh, reproducibly produce the same results in terms of statistical analysis. But we did manage to do that in this project. So um, the question is, if I showed, I compared the amplitude phase distance to an Euclidean distance, did we try other baselines? Yes, in our paper, we actually have five different baselines that are two of, three of them are from simple standard cosine distance or L2 norm or things like that. Two of them are actually different variations of amplitude distance that we tried before ended up ending up on amplitude phase distance. In all of the three cases, amplitude phase distance is the only one that can <coughs> differentiate the three changes that we saw. So in the, uh, I would encourage you to look at the paper if you want to go a bit more detail on that. Yes. So you guys looked at the non-negative one, right? Uh, it's all non-negative, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And that really makes sense for like calculus because you can yeah. like learn that without this tool. Yeah, yeah. Like yeah. Are you sure about that or not? Sure. It, it's not. Okay. It's not. <laughs> So just to repeat the question for the online recording, uh, we in this project that I'm showing on the slide, we used the data smoothing. How did we go about doing it? Uh, it's basically a trial and error, actually. But we do know uh, from our experience um, uh, of working with stacked data that there are certain uh, a physical, so each axis on the x-axis has some physical meaning to it. So you you just need to make sure that you're not uh, uh, combining two different length scales into one single smoothing window. As long as you can do that, it, it works fine. And we actually ran a sweep of different parameters for the smoothing, and our final uh, results in terms of phase mapping didn't really change that much. Um, I would say that the techniques that we developed in our lab uh, have already been used in some of the industries. So there are two ways. One, if the if the if it's a material-driven industry, for example, 3M or uh, I don't know Dow or something like that, they would be building an autonomous platform and then use the both the open source hardware that we developed, which is one of the focus of our group, but we didn't, I didn't get to mention it today, use the code or even the analysis method that we developed uh, to apply it to the material systems. There are also companies such as IBM who are interested in selling the products that are more data on the data side. So they are trying to sell an autonomous platform for material scientists or, mat or enterprises that are, use it, that are in the business of making materials. Uh, and they are interested in uh, working with us in terms of uh, how, uh, how, how did we manage to make this closed loop uh, integration of all this ex complex experimental pipeline. So I would say that on both sides, material side, people are interested in building the platforms by themselves. On IBM, they are interested in product, uh, producing enterprise products for data-driven exploration. Yeah, yes. Yeah. Mm. 
So th the question is about how does uh, materials that have a catalyst material that have stability or activity, such measures can be integrated into the uh, form that you described. So um, I don't know enough about catalytic materials in an experimental sense, but uh, the method that we develop is generic enough as long as the measurement that you are doing is of spectral form. If you are able to capture stability uh, in example, for example, a cyclic voltammetry curve, right, which is a two-dimensional function, but you need to, we needed to develop this method slightly uh, advanced because now the method only works for one-dimensional functions. But as long as you can cap capture the information that you're after in a function form, this entire pipeline would still be the same. You need to, again, swap out the right components for amplitude and phase distance, but at the end of the day, the pipeline should work. 